Okay, so hello and welcome everyone to the School of Astrophysics Weekly Colloquium. I think it's 3.30. So uh, it's our great pleasure to have with us uh, Dr. Ritoban Bushu Thakur from JPL, NASA JPL and Caltech. So Ritoban uh, actually left the country. So uh, I mean, many of us or many of my friends uh, we left the country as uh, like graduate students, but Rituban was ahead of us. So he, after his high school from uh, Don Bosco School, he uh, went for his undergraduate studies to the United States and he graduated from Dickinson College, uh, which is close to a place where I did my PhD in Pennsylvania. And then after his undergraduate uh, studies, he went to UIUC for his PhD and then finally actually completed his PhD through a very interesting program. I'll not get into that uh, with a collaborative program in Fermilab and Stanford and other places. And after completing his PhD, he was a Cabley Fellow at University of Chicago. And then again, a, whole, a small uh, time, he was a postdoctoral Fellow at Caltech and now just uh, joined NASA JPL and also has uh, also is a visiting faculty at Caltech and it's a great pleasure that he is visiting uh, uh, presidency today and he's going to talk about uh, quantum technologies and how we can use them to answer some of the very fundamental and interesting exciting questions of astrophysics and cosmology or rather physics in general. So let's welcome uh, Dr. Ritu Ban Boshu Thakur, okay? Okay, can you hear me? Okay. Oh. Okay, I'll, I'll get started uh, as people flow in. Um, so, uh, yeah, the kind of science that I am part of, it's, uh, you know, understanding what the basic measurements we want to do in pure physics, uh, particularly related to cosmology, and then building uh, precise instruments to, you know, enable that. Um, Okay, um, so yeah, the premise or the existential theme, I guess that's something very precedency, existentialism, uh, is what do you want to do with your, you know, life in this, you know, ex existence? And for our group, it's understanding the universe at its, you know, most uh, epic scales. And here, the sort of paradigm of how you do that is you ask a question, like, you know, for example, do you want to measure something about binary black holes or about the cosmic microwave background? And then you select on that topic, what is the signal, right? So the light that is coming from something, you want to select this. And based on the the light, whether it's x-ray or radio waves, I think I'll have to wait for this first. <laughs> Okay. That's it. All right. Um, and so based on the light that you want to observe, radio waves, x-ray, whatever, you design your telescope. And that that part is in you know two portions. There's the optics that allows you to collect the light. And you know, so if I wanted to see the infrared universe, I cannot use my eyes. That's bad optics for that. So you design that. And then the core thing which our group specializes in is the detectors. So how do you actually measure those photons with the highest signal to noise possible so that you are getting the full suite of information from the thing in the entire universe you want to study? And then of course you do your analysis, right? Your papers and so on, right? So the whole point is physical cosmology via the observation of signals from something. Okay, so are people familiar with this picture in general? Yes, everyone? Okay, so I won't waste time. So this is the whole timeline data driven of everything we know of you know, our universe today. Uh, we are on the far right at redshift zero or today o'clock. And then as we you know, use large scale structure tracers, we go back in time or redshift uh, and we make this you know, timeline of starting with the Big Bang, going through a process called inflation, and then from that recombination, which I'll talk about, 
uh, where the cosmic microwave background comes from. And eventually those quantum fluctuations become the large scale structure in which we are born. So that's sort of the you know gist of this and glad you're familiar. So uh, what is the cosmic microwave background or CMB? Uh, this again might be familiar to many of you, but just to you know, orient the audience, so again, remember in, in time or redshift, this is the past and this is the future or you know, going up to today. And we're focusing on this little slice here. So before that time, and this is approximately a redshift of 1100, the universe has just been born. So you're, you have the, you know, uh, the, the plasma from the Big Bang. So the atoms are not neutral. They're highly ionized because there's a lot of energy and the photons are constantly kicking out electrons from bound states. Mm -hmm. So in a plasma, the one thing we do know is you cannot see through it. And this is a very easy exercise. You can light a candle and try to look through it. You cannot see through it. You can see the light, but you can see through it. So therefore the universe is opaque. Now, as the universe is expanding, things are cooling down. This is again, the analogy of hot water being thrown out. You throw hot water, it cools off. Um, neutral hydrogen can form because now the electrons can bind stably with the protons of the plasma. And at that point, you just have hydrogen gas, which anyone knows is a transparent gas. So now the universe is completely transparent. And so this epoch of recombination where the CMB comes from is marked as the time where the universe goes from opaque to transparent. So what does that mean for us sitting here today? So that means because light travels at a fixed speed, as we know, um, there is a background, a shell of light that you can see coming from that moment the universe went transparent. And the shell of light is like an all-encompassing back, uh, background. So you can look everywhere and it will be isotropic. And what we do know is that this light represents a black body thermal spectrum, and it's a temperature uh, of about you know three Kelvin, so it's pretty cold. And that's you know related with just the redshifting of the universe. Things have you know, stretched out. Um, and this is the monopole term, namely this is the shell, the constant color of the shell, if you will. Uh, however, the picture that I'm showing there is not constant. It has you know, all sorts of red, green, blue spots. And that's the anisotropies that are at higher L or finer structures once you take away the global average. And that texture turns out to be very, very important to cosmology. In fact, you know, precision cosmology for Jim Peebles won the Nobel Prize not long ago is related to these structures or understanding if this is just noise, you know, just random garbage, or if it has any information in it. And as it turns out, if you correlate the structures from one, so you look here and you see a hot spot, red, and you look there and you see a red spot, and this pattern repeats statistically, you, you have understood something deeper that is giving it that periodic structure, so to speak. Uh, although it's a statistical approach, it's uh, not like a perfect guitar string. And from those hot spot, cold spot clusters, we learn all these very unique things about the whole universe. And that is you know, perhaps the most exciting thing about the CMB. You measure this background of light, pretty easy. You measure these hot and cold spots and then you run statistics and simple statistics, you know, even college students can do this. And you learn about how much dark matter there was, how much baryonic matter there was and how they were pulling each other. What was the radiation pressure when the matter was falling within itself. And all of this information uh, rests in here. The other interesting thing that you learn, and uh, this is, I think, of interest to the future of cosmology more than anything, is that these correlations between the hot and cold spots, they exist even if you go to points on the sky that should not have been connected back in time. So they're acausally separated. And so this is pretty crazy. You know, if, if light cannot travel before the CMB and freely communicate, how can two different parts of the sky look statistically identical? And so this whole business is encoded, and this whole idea of the correlations across different angular scales is encoded in these, uh, what are called power spectrum. So this is, if people know what Fourier transforms are, and this is a thing you know, you take that picture, in a 2D space and you make a 1D Fourier transform, that's all we are showing here. And those peaks and valleys are the correlations that are not noise. If it was all noise, you would have a flat line, uncorrelated signal. And the peaks and valleys there encode again, how much dark matter or neutrinos or whatever there is. Now, with any light, you can uh, measure its pure brightness. So like that light, 
or you can wear a polarized sunglass and see the polarization amount in that light. And we can play the same game. And so the lower two curves, the top one is just the temperature curve, is doing the same exercise, but with polarizers. And the polarization components that we have showing here are the so-called E and B modes. And this is, again, you know, college level physics. You have a vector field, you can decompose it, uh, Helmholtz decomposition, you know, people are familiar, into divergence and curl. And those are the polarized spectra that are shown. So any questions on this, please interrupt. I have been told there are a lot of youth and non-experts in the audience. Uh, and the... speaker last week was talking about inflation. So, and, and he spoke about this can be temperature fluctuation. But it seems probably excitement in the case of some of the people who attended the talk last week. Okay, good. So this is, you know, not trivial. So it you know, one slide is easy for me to make, but not easy for someone to comprehend. Uh, but the, the really exciting part in this picture that I like is this is entirely data driven. All those points have error bars because we went out and we measured this thing. And the, those are the errors of my measurement. And within those error bars, you can see these gray dashed lines that are fits. And it's a very simple six parameter fit, again, relating to how much dark matter there is, how much baryonic matter, so on. And just the six parameter fit explains the whole universe across three different channels. This is uh, you know, pretty astounding and humbling when you, such a, and you think about this. Okay, so inflation. Uh, we're gonna you know, travel back now to the zero, so to speak, of the origin of the universe, the Big Bang. Uh, so as I mentioned, across the sky, different regions that should not have been in causal connections have similar, very similar information. So that means at some point they must have been connected so that energy and information has been exchanged so that they look similar. And the only simple answer to that is there must have been a period of rapid expansion. So it wasn't a linear expansion. So there's something you know exponential effectively where things that were very close and were you know, regions of space and time that were talking to each other got pulled apart real fast so that today they appear to be disconnected. And this is inflation. So again, it sounds like you've heard about this. Uh, it also solves a lot of un, you know, big problems in cosmology with the, with the flatness of the universe, why is the universe not curved, uh, absence of magnetic monopoles, uh, and a few other things with the power spectrum tilt and so on. So it's a very simple idea that explains a lot of different things without invoking anything drastically different. So um, great, so you know, this is a theory, we have to measure it. I mean, I get paid to measure things. Uh, so how, how do you do this? So it's a, it's a humbling thing here is that the signal uh, in the polarization are much weaker than the pure temperature. So if you look at the top graph that's sitting at whatever, a thousand in units and the lower graphs are sitting at 10 to the minus two. So a million times weaker. So the signals are not all very loud and strong. So one way we measure this thing is through the polarization again of the CMB. And so you look at that texture map I showed before, but now you do it in the so-called B mode. So these are the curled parts of the polarization. And the theory of inflation uh, states that, uh, or you know, one can expect from it, that if the universe did expand this rapidly in a short period of time, that would cause your space-time metric to be violently affected. Right, so this is uh, common sense because you know you think of LIGO or black holes, you see gravitational waves because there has been a very rapid perturbation of the space-time metric, and here the whole universe is ex experiencing this you know rapid expansion. So it's not surprising that there will be gravitational waves in the background. Um, so the inflation generates these uh, primordial gravitational waves that, unlike LIGO, are not connected with one or two different sources like binary black hole mergers, but it is the entirety of the universe, you know, shuddering as inflation happens. Do you require the um, So if you can measure these polarized B mode, so things that look on the sky like that picture. And the picture, by the way, is not labeled. I have some random pattern I drew, right? Uh, so we have to measure this and we can then set the scale of the red versus the blue, the size of the batches and whatever. 
But if you can measure something like this, these are again the B modes in the CMB, and they are generated by these stochastic gravitational wave background from inflation. And so you can directly probe energy scales and time horizons that otherwise you just cannot do on Earth. And that is a very exciting way to go about your measurement and get inspiration when you're tired. So why is it so? I mean, in a in an elevator pitch, yes, but it's more involved, and uh, so that was my next thing. If you want to read more about this, there's this very nice annual reviews paper, freely available, and explains this in great detail. Uh, and again, someone with a decent physics college education can understand this. Uh, but to answer your question more directly, what's happening is that as I have ripples in space and time, there will an electron that's sitting somewhere will see a hotter object to its right versus left because the gravitational wave has you know, caused some stress in one dimension than the other. This leads to an anisotropic you know, density of heat or temperature. So when you have Thomson scattering from that, it becomes polarized. But why is that polarization this curly pattern? I cannot explain this simply. It requires a bit more vector calculus. And again, this paper is a great uh, example of why. OK, so now we get to the crux of the talk. That was just the intro. Uh, you know, How is precision cosmology done? So how are we measuring these signals that are one part in a million? That's very, very weak. right? Um, that's like finding two people with the same name in this city, which apparently we have. So, um, so how do you do this? So again, you know, the theory and the data are well understood, but how do you actually go about to do this exercise? Um, so if people here are familiar with telescopes, this will look somewhat non-threatening. If you're not familiar with telescopes, this will be very confusing. So I don't know where you are, just tell me. Uh, are people aware of refractory telescopes? Is this a thing, more or less? I think it's a ISC syllabus. Uh, Anyway, so you have two lenses. It's a Galilean telescope, right? And so you have uh, two lenses up top. Those are the curved structures, and they just focus the light onto your detectors. A simple, just generic telescope language. However, the problem here is that we are trying to measure temperature fluctuations that are extremely weak. So if there are photons, thermal photons, coming off the telescope from the body of the telescope, that is not going to help you that is going to confuse you because you know it's sort of like trying to see something, but then the thing in front of you is emanating some light. Okay. So these telescopes have to be uh, very specially engineered so that when you're measuring the CMB, and this is a, to give you an order of magnitude, the color or the frequency of the photons is about hundred gigahertz. No thermal emissions can confuse you in the line of sight. As a result, this entire design, this engineering of this telescope uh, is done so that you filter away any infrared radiation, so things that are you know, brighter or hotter than 100 gigahertz, and then you keep everything else cryogenic, namely everything else is sitting at 4 Kelvin or even cooler. And that way, your instrument is colder than the thing you're trying to measure, and you can measure it. The converse does not allow measurement. Example, you cannot... You know, you're going to see a bird on the sky. If someone's holding a flashlight on your eye, you cannot see that bird. You will be blinded. So okay. you need to make sure there aren't any sources of other light pollution. So that's the telescope in geometry and how we do the cryogenics. But the essence of it is you still have to do the measurement of the photons. We haven't talked about that. You have ensured that you don't get confused. But how do you measure the thing that is coming to you? And to do that, we make these cryogenic uh, camera focal planes, and I'll, I'll get into a little bit on this. Uh, and they're essentially, you know, very loosely, you can think of it like CCDs, right, on your cell phone camera, but it's made with superconductors so that they can measure the smallest electric field that you can impose upon them. So they're very sensitive superconducting cameras. And uh, this is absolutely the pride and glory of JPL. We have been doing this, you know, before I was born, and, you know, all the NASA space telescopes come from this heritage. Any question on this? So, so I, the thing about 
Yeah, maybe explain once more, like how you make your team older than that were infected. Yes. And how many, how many that uh, no, no formal notice. Mm -hmm. Right. So in my generation, this problem is the equivalent of buying a car. You uh, go to a company, you buy the parts, and then you assemble it. But prior to my generation, it was a lot of R and D of cryogenic engineering to ensure that all parts had a, a fridge, essentially a fridge that goes very cold with liquid helium exchange. So you can draw out the heat from every little part there. Uh, these days we buy this. Uh, we buy most of it, but the assembly is still unique and we do that in-house. The detectors you cannot buy. Those are handcrafted by a few of us. Uh, well, we sell them if you are anywhere. Um, so, so yeah, so you need cryogenic engines essentially like a heat engine, but one that cools like a refrigerator, but that uses liquid helium exchange to push things down very, very cold to hundreds of millikelvin. Why do you need the negative Next, yes. So why do you need a superconductor? So first, before we go there, uh, what would it look like if you were in the lab, right, seeing this thing and dealing with it? So that's the focal plane array the, with all the detectors, and that's about a meter in size, roughly. And if you took a you know a good magnifying glass or a cheap microscope and you looked in one corner, you would see some structure like this. And I'll answer your superconducting question very soon. the The premise of the structure is that those lines, the the horizontal vertical lines, are antennas. They're essentially dipole antennas that we have manufactured in a very small size and they collect the photons of your interest, and then you measure it with this so-called superconducting detector, which we'll talk about, but you know, you're just building it down. So, okay, to answer your question, uh, we will begin with just this lower graph here. So what you're seeing there is the canonical picture of any superconductor. If there's a resistance versus temperature, below a temperature, it is superconducting, and above that temperature, it is normal, and there's a step function. So if you have your detector such that you're sitting at the foot of the step, any power that those antennas collect and put on the detector, a tiny amount of power will cause a large change in the density of Cooper pairs. And you will have a very, the, the, you know, the derivative of this curve is very large. And that's why we use superconductors is because we can engineer the derivative of this resistance versus temperature to be arbitrarily sharp as a result a very, very tiny electric field, if you can collect it and harness it, will be sensed. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So another way of saying this, if people hear no electronics, is you want to make an amplifier that can see the input signal, amplify it without noise. This is a very roundabout way of saying what you're saying. And the superconductor very simply becomes an amplifier in resistance versus temperature. So, okay, so the concept's clear, then how do you actually engineer this? How do you build this? So these superconducting detectors, they have to be isolated from the rest of the focal plane because that energy you're getting from the electric field of the photons needs to be contained so that you give it enough time to see the rise in the resistance and temperature. So one of the most, uh, how would I say, overlooked part of why this is a difficult thing to do and why only a few labs can do it is that these islands have to be suspended. It's like the Hara Bridge. You have to suspend this whole thing at a length scale of one to 1,000 so that the energy is contained after you have sensed it. Uh, and then the superconductor kicks in. So the pathway of the signal, again, in summary, is you have the photons from the sky that are coming in. You've filtered it out with your cold telescope optics. You have the antennas that are dipole antennas that resonate at that wavelength, so you collect that energy. Then you do some filtering. This is a simple way of saying, if I want 100 gigahertz, let's make a window maybe around 90 and 110 and discard the rest. And then that power is dumped on the superconducting island, which now has a change in resistance. So the energy of the photons is measured as a change in resistance. Is that clear? This is like you know five people's PhD thesis in one slide, so I, yeah. <laughs> Five people's I would say here. Conceptually. Yeah. Okay. 
So uh, once you build this stuff, you still have to you know, do the work of setting it up. And you unfortunately cannot run this from where I live in Los Angeles right here, because the sky is very bright uh, in microwave, um, thanks to pollution and the atmosphere. Uh, also, cell phone towers are microwave. So you really just cannot do this everywhere. Um, there are a couple of uh, special sites that are designated for this kind of science. Uh, I am part of the what's called the South Pole Observatory. So this is in Antarctica, literally the South Pole of the planet. Um, and we have a suite of telescopes there. Uh, these two are run by Caltech and Harvard, and this one is run by Chicago. This is the South Pole Telescope. These are the bicep telescopes, the one, the pictures I showed you. Um, and the way the telescopes are installed is, uh, you know, uh, it's a hack job of the best quality one can do. It's the best way to put it. So we, uh, you know, these are just pictures of the installation process and myself when I went there, uh, the whole, you know, telescope assembly is loaded up into what called a bay. So the bay is this uh, piece with the plywood uh, things where the telescope just juts out. And then the whole thing is set on the mount. That's the blue thing that moves essentially in three axes. Uh, and then you take data. Uh, so I wrote an article for Telegraph, Kolkata. Uh, you can read about the experience of doing this business. And it's not, it's fun for a few days and exhausting after that. Okay, so coming back to the science of it, we have you know conceptually understood how we build these telescopes. We know what we are going after, these curly B modes. So the question now is where are we as a species in understanding what the hell are we seeing on the sky? And so that's this graph. So if you take again the Fourier transform of this two-dimensional image in 1D space. That's the same power spectrum I showed you before. And all you need to think about is this is uh, the y axis is the power and the power spectrum, and the x axis is frequency, but now in length scale or degrees on the sky because it's an image, not a time series. And almost all experiments, many experiments before us have gone and tried to do this because, again, there's only one shot to measure the beginning of the universe, and it would be nice if it's your group. So, you know, it's a, a highly competitive field. Uh, and this cluster of data points here are essentially upper limits. People who tried, but you know, the telescope wasn't good enough or whatever, the, 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 the measurement wasn't clean. Uh, however, with all due pride, I can say that the bicep cat collaboration is uh, leading this field because we have actually measured these things on the sky. Uh, we are very close, perhaps tantalizingly close to seeing the, the signal of these gravitational waves that come from inflation, that's the dashed lines. But what we are seeing at the moment is the lensing signal. So this is the effect of any uh, uh, object, heavy object in your line of sight that distorts uh, the light coming to you. And But we have measured that very cleanly and we're marching uh, forward to making even deeper and deeper measurements uh, to see this weak signal, if it exists. Um, this is just a progress chart of what that means. I, I'm not going to belabor this point. You have seen the result in the previous slide. Uh, and this is uh, the collaboration for Bicep Keck. Uh, it's a pretty small collaboration by physics standards. Uh, as you can see, everyone's right there. Um, the first two Bicep receivers were let out of Caltech. The next ones are going to be Harvard, Minnesota, and Stanford. And then there are all these supporting team members who contribute either with readout electronics, data analysis, the cryogenics, the parts for you know engineering the filters, all of that. Okay, I'm going to now switch topic and leave the summary of the prior slides. Any question on this? I go back to even where I can sit on. So, what is the improvement? Like, what was the radiometer? I want to uh, only there to come to understand that what is the uh, like the broadcast picture? Of yeah. The improvement? Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, I'll just keep this slide as I explain. So the Dickey rate, any radiometer worked as a power detector by using uh, detectors that were not cold enough. They were at few Kelvin because uh, again, back in the 60s or even 80s, um, making cryogenic instruments was a big, big challenge uh, and not everyone could do this. And then then making the telescope apparatus on top of it is a, you know, is a tremendous feat. 
So there has been, a, as you mentioned, a shift in the radiometer versus bolometer. So the thing that I discussed is exactly what is a bolometer, nothing more. Uh, the transition and sensor, the resistance versus temperature, that's all a bolometer. So in the bolometry generation, the thing that makes uh, experiments better and better is just this picture. Namely, you put more and more of them in the sky because fundamentally we have achieved uh, a, you know, a status of building noise limited detectors, which means the detector itself does not contribute any significant noise. And all the noise you see come from atmospheric fluctuations or the photon noise of the CMB itself. So at that point, you making better detectors doesn't help you. So uh, the only thing you can do is make more and more of them. So you have many more eyes on the sky and you integrate that down. So that, that's the answer. Okay, so yeah, I'm gonna to change uh, topics now. Any, any other questions on the bolometry or the history of CMB or anything? No, great. Okay, so completely different topic. Uh, this is a new field uh, called astrophotonics. Um, and it's, it's new uh, depending on who you ask. So people who have been working in, uh, you know, uh, visible optics, so, you know, hundreds of nanometer wavelength, they have been thinking uh, for the last maybe 10 years of how to use innovations in uh, silicon chip manufacturing that we all use in our cell phones to play with photons and do photonics. So quantum optics people are famous because they do this and they do this very, very well. Uh, but the application of this to astrophysics is somewhat new. And the idea is really summarized by this silly equation that I made up, uh, where you have some astronomical object you want to study. It has information in the photon's you know, mode number, so namely the color of the photon, the spin, whether it's polarized this way, that way, and uh, the physical extent of the object. Is it a point source like a star or is it an extended object like a galaxy? And on the other side, with quantum sensing, we have become really good in the last few years uh, where we can me make detectors that can measure individual quantum fluctuations. So therefore it makes sense that you can connect the two and you can make these on-chip instruments with which you can you know, very precisely measure single quantum fluctuations originating from whatever is on the sky you're trying to study. So this is a new, uh, I think, epoch in precision cosmology that we're beginning in. And, and again, the, the visible optics people have been doing this for the last few years and you know, we are catching up. So a classic example, uh, I don't know if quantum optics is a course that is common. Okay, so if you take this class, then the classic homework problem you will do is this Mach zander interferometer. Uh, so uh, are people familiar with the Mach zander interferometer? No, okay, very good. Some lack of familiarity is good if you're a student or else you shouldn't be a student. Uh, so the idea is very simple. Ignore that diagram. Just imagine in your head, you have a uh, light coming from some object you want to study. Then you split the light in two parts. And then in one part, you introduce a phase delay by simply making the distance the light needs to travel longer. And then you sum it back up. So now what you have done with the electric field is this purple equation. You had an electric field at the input, you split it in two parts. There goes my lunch. Uh, and then you recombine it on the other side and now you have a phase delay. So what you would get as you change the, the delay, this tau variable, is you would have a very simple thing of constructive and destructive interference, right? So if my phase delay is one wavelength, I will have constructive interference. If it's half a wavelength, quarter wavelength, I'll you know, make this thing. So this is a Mach Zander interferometer. It's uh, famous for many things. One for proving Einstein right, and you know, essentially uh, showing ether is not a thing. And secondly, for LIGO, gravitational wave detectors are exactly this. So, and there are many other applications. In astrophysics, the applications of this in the, uh, what's known as a Fourier transform spectrometer are immense. So it's well known to us humans. But what we haven't done so far is uh, make it astrophotonic. Um, so we can build these in large scales, but we you know, don't know how to build them small. So the next part of my talk is how I made it small. So the way you make this kind of stuff on a chip effectively means you have to really think outside the box because classical optics has been around for a very long time. And if the problem could have been solved with lenses and prisms, it would have been solved, right? This, you know, 
So what we looked at is innovations in quantum materials. So I have some background in condensed matter physics, so you know, equivalent like learning Persian or whatever. But uh, once we found this material, this is again a superconductor that is very thin. It's ten nanometers thin, uh, and you can you know you can draw with it. It's literally you can take a silicon canvas and you draw with it whatever you want. And I'll show you the things we have drawn. But two fundamental properties of this uh, material uh, are these two bullet points here. One is that in this material you manipulate the Cooper pairs so that the phase velocity, the speed at which the, the electromagnetic field is traveling in that material is 0.1% the speed of light. What does that mean? Now, audience question. What, what does that actually mean? If you can reduce the phase velocity by some fraction of this. Hmm? There is no dispersion. So it's very simple, very straightforward. Sine of omega t, nothing fancy. But I'm changing the phase velocity compared to the speed of light by some number, uh, what does that mean? Okay, and therefore? Hmm? So equivalency is being decreased. What does that, does that mean physically? It's a very simple answer, nothing profound. Exactly. So, yeah, but in reverse, you make it small. So, if you can, so you know, right, 0.1% of C is 10 to the minus 4, right? So, that means something that used to take one meter with the lens and this and that. I can make it very small. And that's the whole impetus, is how can you make things small? Because as we discussed, you need many of these detectors, not one. And when you can compactify something more than a thousand times, it really opens up the future, right? Like, you know, uh, imagine increasing our bank balance a thousand times, it would be very different. Uh, the other thing that matters is, okay, you have compactified it, great, but how do you manipulate the, the you know, the microphysics, right? So I can make it small, but the equivalent of the Mach Zender delay element, how do I do that? Back in the day, we do it with two mirrors and you move the mirror part, but I have no moving parts. So that's the other advent of this material is that we can control that uh, uh, delay with a DC bias. So it's, it's carrying signals. The sine omega T here is at 100 gigahertz, right? Which is right, radio frequency or AC. But by applying DC, I can change what that speed is by tens of percent. So now I have a delay element that is both smaller and tunable by very modest amounts of current. And this data we took, uh, I literally used a 1.5 volt battery and a resistor. It's that easy. And no optical alignment is required because you have perfectly imprinted it on this canvas with nanometer precision. And your wavelength at gigahertz is much more than a nanometer. So you have solved all the annoying problems in your lab in optics that you face with, with aligning the things, gone. So, so that's the beauty of this uh, quantum material. And the other thing now, now, now you're gonna get into the domain of astrophysics, where, what do you want to do with it? This is cool, but why, why am I giving an SOA talk? Well, because you want a spectrometer and it is important to think about the resolution of that spectrometer. And what we have achieved so far is gigahertz resolution at 100 gigahertz transmission, and we're pushing it now to megahertz, which is again, unthinkable because if you need megahertz resolution in a you know room optic setup, it would be bigger than this room. And the thing I'll show you is much smaller than this room. Um, so these are the good things coming from quantum materials, and now we build the thing. So this is the real picture taken in the lab with the microscope. And I take you back to the cartoon drawing of the Mach Zender interferometer from a textbook quantum optics. So keep this picture in your head, just naively imprinted in your memory. And now look at that. It's one for one, the same thing. And it's doable because now this I have reduced this optics problem to a circuit theory problem. So if I have a long line, I have an inductor. If I have a fatter line, I have a capacitor. So I've reduced this purely in the domain of electronics or photonics, where again, industry standard is very high. We can fabricate things really precisely. And so this is a four port on-chip 
Moxander interferometer, which I anointed as SOFT, which stands for superconducting on chip Fourier transform spectrometer. And using the two properties we discussed, we can now measure interferograms on it. And uh, to prove a point to NASA, I decided to go for the largest wavelengths that radio astronomy or, or people in cosmology care about and make the smallest possible device. Because if you can do that, then you can do any other device much smaller. And so this is in the proverbial Ka band, which is about 30 to 40 gigahertz. And you can see the interferograms as a function of delay or current biasing measured with this device. Uh, so this is the first device we measured. This is the first data set. Obviously, it's not perfect. There's room for improvement, but the proof is in the pudding, and you know, you're going to put it. So any questions on this? Clear, more or less? So you don't, you, that, that's the beauty of, so I decide as the person in the lab, how I want to do my measurement. So it is dominated by lunch and coffee break. So when I scan this, I set up a, a, power, a source that scans at whatever, one hertz, doesn't matter. But the interference is happening at gigahertz scale. Therefore, it's coming out as nanosecond. So that's an internal beauty of these kinds of devices generally, not just this one, is because of that modulation, you can operate in what we call audio band. Audio band is a very simple way of saying, uh, you know, a human's ability to you know, flip a switch. But the actual physics is happening not in audio band. It's happening in full-on RF, you know, where you are sciences. So the control electronics for this is much, much simpler than most other things we've been doing because of that. Absolutely, yes. So this particular device is made with something called niobium titanium nitride. This is a nitride. Uh, but yes, yeah, so there are a lot of materials. I mean, I didn't invent this material. It existed. I read the literature and connected the dots. Um, so yes, there are a few selected superconducting materials, which when you know manufactured the right way, gives you these properties. So, 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 so there are ways to kind of uh, find out when these materials can be used for making like yeah, so this is why the field is very new because you know before myself this was not a thing that is done, and now uh, this last year we got a pretty generous internal grant to explore exactly this question of trying out different materials and you know, building devices and seeing how the delays work or whatever. Yes, so one of the things uh, for Jet Propulsion Lab is it's one of NASA's dedicated centers for material science research. And so there are people who have their, you know, PhDs in chemistry who work there and who do that hard work. Uh, but to, for them to do it, you have to justify it with a space case. And I think this is one of the first ones where the can of worms has been opened up and now more funding hopefully will come to do this. Um, yeah, it's it's not, and uh, how do you say, it? the formula for doing this is not written at all. We are learning as we go. And to answer your question about machine learning, so one step removed, and this is a you know, slogan for anyone who wants to do summer research, uh, we are looking for machine learning uh, applications in designing devices given the material properties, because that's again a lot of work, like you're indicating. So material properties comes from the chemists, and then how you lay it out, right? That that manufacturing part, we have done it by you know pen and paper calculation, and it's never going to be perfect. And so we are you know thinking about a summer student who will work on this with some version of AI. I'm not a computer scientist, so we'll have to figure out what that means. Right. Okay, so again, why why do you okay you you know, made a thing that looks nice, can do all sorts of cool stuff, but why do you care? Like, why should a billion dollar national agency pay you to do this? Right, like that's a very practical question. So the analogy is really this. So if you uh, know about the history of computing, 
during the Manhattan Project, there were many big computers, for example, Mark I, which is at Harvard, uh, that von Neumann and Feinern used famously for cross-section calculations, and that are you know, as big as this room. Right, but now a Raspberry Pi that you can probably buy in Chandni Chowk can do the same thing better. And how did we get there? Because we got rid of electromechanical parts for semiconductor technology. That's the same sort of philosophy that I have here. We are getting rid of optomechanical parts for photonics on chip things, and now you can you know condense things and do a lot more operations and. Uh, we haven't even discussed photonic computing with these things, so that's a whole different ballgame. So you can mix signals, add delays, and do all sorts of FPGA-like processing, but at terahertz, which you know, God knows what that will bring us uh, bring uh, to the table. But you know, that's a whole new ballgame that has started. And this uh, CAD drawing is for uh, astrophysics interferometer called Pixie that NASA was trying to back for measuring the CMB spectrum very accurately, and we have now done this on chip. So, you know, I suppose that's why they're giving a job. Uh, so what what does that mean again? So uh, we are trying to build with these small devices an array, again, like the bolometer idea of thousands and thousands of these coupled with the same kind of cryogenic telescope I showed you. But now, unlike before, instead of just measuring the brightness at 100 gigahertz, I can measure the color spectrum in a large window because this is a spectrometer. It gives me color information, not just the total intensity. So we can have the same types of telescope, but get full color information. And if you know anything about physics, you color helps. The moment you can distinguish, you know, something is red versus brown or whatever, you learn about the microphysics of what's in that object. What are the atomic or molecular excitations? That's why it's very vital to space sciences. Um, okay, so I just talked about this. The game plan is to you know, again, take the old focal planes, but inject the spectrometers between the antenna and the detector. So you can have thousands of them. Uh, and why do we care for this in the science case? So one you know, sort of theme in uh, physics that's a cosmology that's evolving is the spectral distortions of the CMB. So we have measured this to be a 2.73 Kelvin black body, I think when I left kindergarten, something like this. And since then, no one has measured this. Uh, and if you work out your basic you know, quantum field theory calculations, you can quickly show, and I, as an experimentalist, I'm telling you it's quick to show, so it's really easy, that um, the photon talks with every particle. As a result, the early universe, which is rich with all sorts of particles, will leave a spectral impact in the CMB. This is you know, again, very simple. Closer to astrophysics, you can use spectral distortions to measure the plasma in galaxy clusters. So there's another project I'm doing with a First year undergrad, no, he's now second year undergrad in using this kind of spectrometer to get the, the color of the plasma. Uh, and so there's a lot of you know, interest in using the spectral distortion of the CMB to understand things that couple with photons in general. And there is a white paper I wrote with a bunch of people in Europe. Uh, just going to put it up there. There's a huge gamut of science cases that uh, in early universe physics you can uh, get to. And I'm happy to say last year, the European Space Agency selected this as their 25 year mission theme. So now I have to actually build this stuff and sell it. It's a bit of a pressure. But uh, the cool part is that look at this axis, this is redshift. Once you can take the color of the CMB very precisely, you can measure the physics happening at redshifts of 2 million. That is as close to the Big Bang as you can ever get. So there is you know, real impetus on what we want to do with this stuff. And that for reference, what does the spectral distortions look like? I mean, they just look like this. You're taking away the black body and you have some wiggles connected with you know, injection of energy or uh, absorption. Approaching big bang, yeah. Yeah. And what what kind of so um the, the 
you know, list of physics is, yeah. Right. So th there is no specific inter. I mean, there are specific microscopic interactions that you're integrating over in cosmic volume that is giving you this distortion, right? right? And so, depending on which volume slice you're, you know, having the most influence, you'll get a physics of that slice. So the there are many science cases that again is here, and this paper was written by fifteen people, so you know, there's a lot of work. But the thing that personally I like is the damping of the CMB will lead to uh, uh, spectral distortions. So you can measure inflation in a completely different way and angular scales that, again, you cannot do otherwise. But there's, there, there's a whole bunch of stuff that primordial magnetic fields, I have no idea what that is, so I have no idea. Yes. Sorry? Very good question. So that will be the slide after this. Okay, we'll get there. So right now, let's say with frequency, okay? So why do you care? Uh, so I think this sentence was uttered by, um, what's his name? George Smoot, who once was getting coffee and he was like, you want to do CMB, that's good. And I'm like, all right, yeah, you got a Nobel Prize. Of course you will say it's good. And then he said this sentence, which is that between the CMB and you, there's the whole universe. If you can do that, you can make measurements of everything. And I don't know, that sentence stuck with me. Uh, and for astrophysics particularly, you have interstellar and intergalactic medium, right? That's the most common thing you will have out in deep space. And so you can probe that. And in the, you know, after a rich hit of, uh, let's say, six or seven, you have some molecules, metallicities that have formed like carbon, oxygen, nitrogen. And this is a, uh, this picture NASA loves a lot. So I've been included everywhere. It's the interstellar life cycle of how different uh, molecules are processed in supernovae and then in star formation and how that episodic cycle plays out. But the long story short is there are a lot of molecules undergoing different types of chemistry and physics. So spectroscopy would be very useful to disentangle what you're seeing. Right, so so that's the thing. Now your question about spatial scales, yes. So uh, this graph is showing just the the spectrum, there's the spectral distortion of the CMB in Y and mu distortion, the thing we were talking about here, the yellow and the gray, and everything else you see here are these line emissions from carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and so on. But previously, these spectrometers I showed you, the big ones, they had no spatial resolution. They were one big beam on the sky. So you couldn't ask the question, if I am seeing more, we'll call it red color versus green color, is it coming from this part of the galaxy or that part of the galaxy? Because we can miniaturize these things, we can put it in a focal plane of a telescope, we now have simultaneous beams on the sky. So we are going to slice this not only in color space, but also imaging. And that's the end goal. Because no, color is good, but you know, you still need to know like an apple looks different from a banana at some point in your life, right? So um, so you need both aspects of it. Um, so this is a sensitivity curve. I, I'm happy to discuss this more if people care. Uh, these brown lines are what we forecast we can do with these on-chip spectrometers with 4,000 of them. And for reference, current CMB telescopes use 10,000 of them. So with far less, we can get a lot more aspiration. I mean, we have to see where it actually ends up. Um, so finally, uh, you know, this is not the only astrophotonic device one can think of. In fact, for every spectrometer that you can use in any physics, chemistry, biology lab, you can think about miniaturizing all of them. And so I was invited a part of this NASA panel to write the roadmap paper for this year on astrophotonics, where we uh, covered the successful development of three types of spectrometers all on chip. So this paper will come out next month. So, you know, that's the advertisement. Uh, but it's very new, uh, you know, like the field is so new that I, as a postdoc, I got invited on a panel to write this thing because people really need to rethink how to engineer quantum optics for astrophysics. And so there's an open call for any young person to get involved in. There's a lot of work uh, that needs to be done and can be done. Uh, so this is uh, the list of people who are behind the on-chip uh, FTS project. Uh, so it started off with myself uh, at Chicago, and then we have gathered a whole lot of colleagues. We are still looking for people, mostly in these kinds of um, 
software and do design devices and you know so on and so forth. So reach out if you have any interest. And uh, with that, I'll end and just leave the summary. Thanks. Great. Oh, that's very nice. Uh, Hello. Yeah. So, time for questions. Questions is Chandra and then Orlando. Chandra, please. So, thank you for the nice sir. So, uh, probably in the 26th slide, you showed that uh, we need to improve the quantum optics for the dark matter is. Uh, yeah. Yes. Is that so, how do you, like, what exchanges do you plan for the dark matter? Then, one thing is the lens is on the interaction for the data is on how that's my question. Okay. So when I wrote this, I wrote this with my particle physics hat on and not the cosmology hat on. So this is probes of dark matter with quantum sensing, which is a big theme in the US. I don't know if it's big in India or not yet. No, it's not big, but uh, you know, it costs a little, little bit, but it's not yeah. big. Yeah, so the, the so just to it has nothing to do with this cosmology stuff. When I wrote this, it might you might have this idea, and we should you know do something about it. Uh, but when I wrote this, it was very much in the sense of direct detection of dark matter, uh, particularly for axions and axion-like particles because they're right there. Photon frequency, effective photon frequencies again in the gigahertz, terahertz. So you can do very precise measurements. Um, so I uh, proposed this to a student and a postdoc for fun, completely joking. They took it seriously, and we have written a paper on this. And uh, so it's one of these fields where there's so little achievement, so to speak, that any new idea you come up with, if it's not you know prohibited by the laws of physics, you can do something about it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the nice talk. So my question is uh, regarding, regarding slide number seventeen. So uh, I'm sorry, like this looks uh, pretty much complicated for me. This uh, so I actually did not properly understand. So it seems kind of an angular power system. So uh, in the so what is the role of B mode in this angular power spectrum? So um, so okay, so anything that is on the sky can be anything that is not a constant across the sky. You can do an angular power spectrum of it, right? Yeah. So the thing that we are trying to do an angular power spectrum off is the B mode structures on the sky. Namely, you take the data from your polarized uh, telescope, or your telescope that has polarization sensitivity. You take the E and H plane. Is that does that make sense? E and H. Yeah. You combine them to make the equivalent B modes. So these are the the eigenmodes that will have divergence equals to zero. So those modes you are now going to take a power spectrum off. Okay, why? You can do many things in life, why? So the reason is that we expect for inflation to give us B modes, which are of this type of shape, this dashed lines, yeah, the highlighted box. So we are just simply measuring the B mode power spectrum, like we're measuring the B mode power spectrum, and then we are seeing where our measurements are, and if we, no pun intended with literally the letter R, and if we can make clean measurements, so if this error bar here were to shrink by, say, a thousand times, which is our aspiration, we can then very cleanly see what lives about the lensing tail. And that would be the indication of. There are, there are no fits here. This is just life, no fits. Expected. Yeah. These are the data points, are data points, and the, the yeah, expected. That's right. So that R is the same R that the scale has been selected. So that that determines your amplitude of the non-spectral. So remember that related to the amplitude of the intake spectral. So how much how much correlation amplitude of intake spectral? Okay. Next, uh, any other questions uh, from the audience? Yes, Okita, and then Mitobar. Uh, so there was a plateau war in the natural the last year. Um, yeah, so that's a good question. Uh, it's a good question because only last year we had a first official working group to address this problem. So it's very new and nascent. 
Um, so, so far, most in the two types of intensity mapping experiments that people are doing. One is like the, the hydrogen one with 21 centimeter that use radio telescopes, right? And the other is very much like CMB, where you have spectrometers where you select colors and then you do a map of the sky at different colors. Okay, so we are taking that latter part and asking if we can do the measurements with quantum photonics or astrophotonics, whatever the jargon is, you can do those measurements much more cleanly. And so you can separate signals in redshift space very accurately along with the question of the beam on the sky so that you can structurally separate large scale structure coming from CO versus C2, which might be very different. So uh, excuse my ignorance, but uh, the, the technology that the LIGO group is using to detect this very small shift in the print pattern due to the relative sunset, that is, is it that astrophotonics too, or is, I mean, they are using quantum properties of. Uh, uh, I did, yeah, sure, why not? So, no, I'm asking that how, I mean, so, um, so they are, uh, aren't they using sort of similar sort of material science devices or something like that? No, so, so in, in the principle of it, you are absolutely right. This interferometer for CMB spectral distortion is very similar to LIGO in principle. In fact, they all can be analytically expressed with this homework problem. Absolutely, no questions asked. Um, but the way you realize it in real life is very different between LIGO and this. Because for LIGO, you want free space lasers, right? And you have these mirrors and the fabric perro cavity effects and so on and so on. So it's just a very different thing entirely. Is it doing astronomy? Yes. Is it using photonics? Yes. So that part is absolutely yeah. But you cannot so far build a thousand LIGOs, right? And that's set by the scale of the engineering. Okay, any other questions? Yes, it's in the case of radio, radio frequencies, most of the time, are you not telling us to do in other ways then, or it's not possible now? So, okay, so I, I left a slide on this. Maybe I should have had this. So, uh, ambitions are very strong. We want to go from anything between one gigahertz to three terahertz. Um, but beyond that, beyond the terahertz, it's not meaningful because you have. You know, radio astronomy instruments that work pretty well, right, at five terahertz or whatever, a few terahertz. And above that, you are in the far infrared, where it's a whole different ballgame and people have made instruments. There is nothing much new to do there. Uh, lower than one gigahertz is again meaningless because now your wavelengths are so big, you're better off with uh, essentially dispersed arrays of radiometers, like uh, GMRT or something like that. But the window is one gig tilde one gigahertz to tilde one terahertz. Any other questions? Yes, Ori. Yeah, thank you for the talk. Uh, once you commented that uh, that detail in the CMB will give us more information about the inflation, right? Uh, yeah. So I didn't understand uh, why. So I'm sure. sure. Um, okay. So just focus on the temperature and isotropy power spectrum, the top curve. Okay. Ignore the other two. So if the if everything was isotropic in spectral sense, this would be a flat line. You wouldn't have peaks and valleys. In fact, when the universe started, it was flat, and you have the peaks just coming from baryon acoustic oscillations. This dip that you see above, uh, uh, whatever, 0.2 degrees or so, this, you know, that's coming from energy essentially being lost by relativistic particles that are moving out. So this damping is known as silk damping. That energy is going somewhere, right? I started with this thing, I got this thing. What, what's the gap? Where is that going? So th that encodes a lot of interesting physics, one of which is you can measure inflationary potentials with that. Oh. Comment on that. Uh, so you are suggesting that so the 
random walk of the photon, right? You are suggesting that when we just say photon, because we call relativistic species, it should be thought of in the infusion process that we are seeing the erasing of the temperature fluctuation. But you are saying that uh, in this random walk of relativistic species, you somewhat also capture the signature of uh, the, the inflation potential. I mean, that's to determine like what the number of relativistic species, or I mean, just it's degenerate. It might, it might be it's very highly clear. degenerate. It's highly degenerate as well. So you need something like SPT to measure the you know, effective neutrino mass or relativistic species, and then you can take that out from the equation. And what you have is the tilt in the power spectrum, right? And that tilt in the power spectrum is set by inflation. I see. Okay, so that's something very interesting. I've think about it. That's very nice. But yeah, since that we can move So I, I would just say read that paper. It, you know, people who wrote it are mostly theorists and they did a good job. Yeah, very well. Yeah. So yeah, Jens is now calling me every hour to like do something about this instrument. Really? Yeah, so we are potentially going to try and build a small uh, and book. Very much into this slide and really That's right. Yeah. Okay, if you have any questions? Yeah. Okay, so uh, regarding the actual measurement of uh, v mode and polarization, um, is it I mean, even if the measurements are very precise, uh, sort of the modeling of the foreground or dust, et cetera, that will always be a problem, right? I mean, and how, how good is our model of our understanding of the foreground? Yes. So uh, that is why, you know, we have been fielding these telescopes, not just at 100 gigahertz, but lower, 30 gigahertz, all the way to, to get a handle on this. And for CMB stage four, which is this next generation array of such telescopes, there will be eight such channels, the colors you will measure. And the aspiration is that is good enough to get, you know, relatively simple models like a broken power law inferred for this. Um, at some point, it turns out, this is a, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. Well, anyway, you're um, limited by the cosmic variance and not so much by the foregrounds. And if we reach that depth, it's we don't know what to do next. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? So you brought, I just have a very simple question. So what was the improvement, uh, let's say from, <clears throat> Act to act pole or from act SPD to SPD pole that enabled us to sort of put even better constraints, I think, on like maybe lower limit or something on the uh, CMD, the, the B mode, I think, right? That's right. So, That's okay, right. so there are two different B modes we are dealing with here. One is the lensed B modes. Yes. So, for that, act and SPD are better because they have a fine angular resolution. And again, the same answer, many more detectors. So your measurement precision is better. That's what enabled them. But that's only measuring that hump of the lensing up there, right? So that's this thing. That's not what inflationary people care about. We care about the degree scale features where SPT or ACT has nothing to do, with, so to speak, directly. Indirectly, we still need their measurements of the lensing v modes to you know, undo this big hump so you can look below it. Yes, so, um, so I, I guess that means, uh, you know, when I say SPT call, is that the same thing or is that changing the detector? Oh, every it's not the, is it the SPT detector? This is, SPT sorry, call? so this is not any, by any means, a recent graph. This is just to illustrate the point. Uh, recent experiments have uh, advanced ACT and SPD 3G, yes. which are far more precise in their measurements on this. So, no, so maybe my question is even simpler than that. So when I, because you know, act and SPT, I just imagine when you add the pole, we don't change, there's nothing, no change in the detector. This is like uh, the name of your latest Hyundai car that is coming out. Yeah. Is, the latest Hyundai car is coming out, it's the name of the thing, there's a meaning. Of it. So it's just a polarization, pole for polarization. It's not a, like a new detector or anything. That is the more fundamental truth that every generation of every telescope has newer detectors and better detectors. The name of the telescope or the instrument is something someone made up and. Oh, no, I was just trying to yeah. find 
to try to find out that uh, what was the input, maybe there is an improvement. Uh, Again, number of number of photon noise limited detectors that can measure polarizations. If you can increase that, you are okay. Great. Uh, any other uh, questions, comments? If not, let's thank the speaker. Yes. Uh, oh, that's the provocative question. You should have asked. Bicep was like 2015, right? Or 14? Yeah, 2014 or 2015, 2014. Yeah, I don't know what happened.